let's get things going. Yamaha Star Racing. Inside, inside, you got it. Go. Ready for another championship Hooper fight. Hooper Webb. Hooper Webb. I love it. I mean, this has been an incredible season. And Danger Boy does it's it. It's a Yamaha night. Hooper this Webb. man shows what a fighter he is. Hooper, Hooper Webb. Webb. Yeah, it's SMX Insider, your weekend preview for Nashville, Monster Energy Supercross, and SMX World Championship. We are the Jasons, Wygan and Thomas. But how did we get here? How How is this series tied? Where's the highlight reel of Jet Lawrence cartwheeling in the whoops or trying some quad or quint that he couldn't do and getting hurt? That didn't happen. Yet somehow his points lead's gone, JT. It's amazing how different the series feels, looks, is. You know, leaving Indianapolis, that, that was where I was like, man, this really feels like it's about to turn into a runaway. Might as well just hand Jet Orange the trophy right here, right now. And then we're going into Nashville tied up, as you mentioned, and everything feels different. Momentum has swung the other way. Cooper Webb is firmly back into this, and you can just see it in his face. You can, After the race, he's just so much more confident, and he knows the opportunity that he has with four races left to go. Yes, and what makes this even more intriguing is these are two riders that do it in a completely different manner. Now, we got to give Webb credit. He's definitely getting faster, and we will talk to Cooper Webb in this episode about that. He'll be our big interview guest. He's getting faster, but Jet Lawrence is still really fast. This is two totally different ways to slice it that have ended up exactly the same in the points. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's interesting to see the racecraft and the strategy and just like, you know, legends of the past have said, there's no two ways to, to win a championship, to win a Supercross race. So uh, I don't know which one will win out. We I feel very fortunate that we have this championship fight this close, this late. You know, you and I both know that it doesn't always go this way. We've had runaways in the past, but these two Titans seem ready for the fight uh, down all the way to the last lap in Salt Lake City. Yes. And... That's why when Jet was on the three race win streak, we were starting to look at previous runaway seasons as our model, not what we've got now, even though Cooper Webb's doing it in Cooper Webb ways. Maybe we shouldn't have been that surprised. So that's exciting enough going to Nashville. We also have a 250 East West showdown with titles on the line. We'll talk about that. So much to come on this episode and this weekend. But most importantly, let's just talk to Cooper Webb. Well, we're lucky to be joined by Cooper Webb here, who's on a roll, 1-2-1 one, one in the last three races. Did you have a vision that it could work out like this? I mean, 21 points down, and to Jet Lawrence is pretty daunting. You've been up front. You know, you respect how good Jet is. Was there a vision a month ago that you could see this happening, or is it actually surprise yourself how quickly it's come together? A little bit of both, right? Uh, I think it definitely came quicker than I was anticipating, um, but... You know, I think the biggest thing was to not lose hope, right? And um, I felt like I was getting dealt some adversity, and, and you'll have that over 17. And he was just clicking them off one at a time, you know, winning, winning, winning. So um, I just, you know, feel like I've, I've been in this position before and kind of knew at some point, you know, no, no matter what, no matter how much momentum you got, you're going to have some adversity come. And, uh, you know, he definitely, unfortunately, had some. So, uh, you know, I put myself in a great position position to capitalize and like I said going one two one the last three weeks definitely helps that and uh yeah it's it's awesome to be where we're at and but it, it definitely was tough at times when you're that far back you kind of uh you're trying to make up headwind but uh he's very tough to to beat so uh feels awesome to be in this position so I have to ask what was different this weekend and I know you're gonna say oh nothing same old thing we've just been practicing but there was a noticeable difference right off the bat. You know, J Justin Brayton and I were texting each other in the middle of race day live about, hey, did you see Coop in that last practice? He just had more intensity. So maybe you don't know, maybe it's truly just was kind of that day, but do you know that there was something different? Because for all of us watching that don't get to be there every day, it looked a lot different on Saturday than it had in previous weeks. Yeah, I think for me, it was one of those days when you just wake up and you, you feel good. Um, but also, I think the weekend off, we were able to, uh, I've been dealing with a little bit of a, a nagging you know, injury. So I think that was able to kind of heal up and then um, was able to just have really good practice during the off, off weekend and just really focus on, hey, speed is what we need, you know, and, and not only going fast, but doing it uh, in a way that's also efficient. So uh, we really kind of honed in on that and, and just really tried to, 
to, to perfect, you know, as much as we could. And I think it kind of paid off. You know, I felt like my speed was really good. Uh, I saw, you know, obviously for me, qualifying is great. But even in the main event, I had the fastest lap time, which is um, rare, to be honest. So I think that was huge. And then, you know, to lead every lap, to get a whole shot, to qualify P1, it was just one of those days where everything was really clicking for me and I uh, felt super comfortable, confident. And uh, it definitely was a must kind of win situation. Uh, I talked about a little bit in the press conference, but had, you know, that eight points is, is close, but Jet could have easily taken advantage of that and, and gotten it back into double digits. So um, I was super stoked to to come out, you know, felt like it was a very clutch moment and uh, to be all tied up with four to go is, is amazing, really is. All right, last thing, give us a little preview here. We got four to go. You've been in this situation a lot. You've always been a clutch guy. What do you think we might be in store for here for these last four rounds? Because I feel like this is your wheelhouse right here. It is, man. I, I definitely pride myself in these positions. And I, honestly, I'm just excited, right? I think the biggest thing is now um, it, it's more stressful for me when I'm behind in points, if I'm if I'm honest. So I think now that it's a, it's a clean slate and I'm not having to play catch up anymore. Um, I feel like, like I said, my riding is, is where it needs to be. Um, I really love these clutch situations. I feel like I handle pressure really well. And, um, you know, it's not going to be easy by any means. It's going to be an absolute barn burner till the end. And I'm sure Jet's going to, you know, go in, go into a mode that he's he's going to be the best version of himself too. So um, just got to stick to what we've been doing, you know. And I think um, it's going to be really entertaining for all the fans. It's going to be entertaining even for myself. and. Like you said, I think for, for me, I dream to be in these positions to, to go down the stretch and win a championship, especially after last year. It's just nice to, to be in this position again, and I'm looking forward to the challenge. Oh, great stuff from Cooper Webb there. Let's move to our 30-second board. We do want to flash back to Foxborough real quick. Highlight is Webb winning. Low light is the mud off the side of the track, JT. This was turning into unintentional comedy all afternoon. <laughs> Yeah, it started off in the uh, in, in the futures qualifying there with Gavin Towers going into the mud and you, you just couldn't move the motorcycle. It was stuck almost in quicksand uh, off the side of the track. And you wondered as the qualifying sessions went on, when did anybody else have this same issue on another section of the racetrack? And boy, did we ever. Seth Hamaker with the dismount of a year, I had 10 out of 10 there, like you could talk, say whatever you want about the mistake, but the dismount was absolutely flawless. And then uh, last but not least, David Poley here, same mistake, same end result, and same forklift having to pull his motorcycle off of the racetrack. So uh, something we don't see very often, you know, feel bad for those guys, but luckily no harm, no foul. We also had a futures race at Nashville, so we want to give a tip of the visor. Drew Adams, JT, this dude's blowing up. Yeah, it's, uh, that's three in a row for this kid, and he turned 16 years old the day after his second win in St. Louis. And you got to think the future looks pretty bright. I'm sure Mitch Payton is rubbing his hands together in delight at having this new talent on the horizon. And this has been a renaissance year for that Monster Energy Pro Series Kawasaki team anyway. So to have this kid kind of in waiting, in staging to, to join that team, uh, he just looks great, right? And, and there's going to be a learning process for him. I don't think he's ready to go out and battle the best of the best in the 250 Pro Supercross side. but. You can see him improving. You can see the confidence building in these kids, which is such a pivotal part of the picture. Here's what I like. You immediately said, give me the lap times. How does he compare to the 250 riders? What did you learn there? Yeah, he's still got some some learning to do. He's a, he's a couple seconds off, which I think is to be expected. And really, all I was trying to do is understand, is he Hayden Deegan in 2023, where he's going to turn our futures race into a top five the very next weekend in Houston? Or... Is it a little bit tougher? You know, does he have some some growing to still do? And I think he does. You know, it's just a different dynamic jumping in the deep end of the pool with the, the best 250 riders in the world. So he's got time. We won't see him until at least the summer, maybe next year. Uh, so yeah, I think he's, he's on the path that he should be. And speaking of those, those guys that he's gonna have to race, right? It's on the horizon for him. The showdown, the first showdown of the year is on tap in Nashville. And these are my favorite races because let's face it, we don't get to see the best of the best go head to head very often. We have to wait till pro motocross to see that every single weekend. So who is better? The East guys, the West guys. I always think about what this does to the points, right? If you're RJ Hampshire in, in the West Coast Championship, if you're Hayden Deegan in the East Coast Championship, 
these races can be your best friends because this is your opportunity to make up gaps and points. If you can go out there, put it your best foot forward, win this race, and maybe your rival gets a fifth, a sixth, or worse, you can completely flip the championship picture. And I think it puts a lot of pressure on the championship leaders too. They know that big gaps and points can be made and lost this weekend. And they have everything to lose. So I think it just adds a whole new level of intrigue to both the East and the West championships. Yeah, you just saw Tom Vale's only down four on McAdoo and Deegan's down 13, which seems like a lot with three races to go, but two out of the three remaining East races are these showdowns. But as you and I started bench racing about this, I brought up the point that these showdowns, we get weirdo winners a lot. I remember Jeremy Martin out of title contention, winning in Indy years ago. I feel like this is like a Joe Shimoda, Nate Thrasher style event. We'll have a lot more data on this coming up with Clinton Fowler later. And you said you think a lot of that is pressure actually on the title contenders. Yeah, and, and it's one of those things where they can just go in and ride carefree oftentimes. I'm going to make a prediction. I don't think it's going to go that way this year. I don't think you're going to see the outlier racer like a March Banks or a guy that's not in the championship win the race. I think it's going to be one of the guys because the results have been so clear who are the best guys. So I think it'll be either one of the top three in the East or one of the top four in the West. If it's anyone outside of that, I will be very, very surprised because those seven riders have really shown themselves to be the best of the best in this 250 class thus far. Oh, it's going to be so good. A make or break weekend if you have to make up points in the championship. Also fun when we go to Nashville, that's the closest race we have to St. Jude proper, St. Jude's actual children's hospital. And JT, you're going to go visit. This is over in Memphis on Thursday. A real opportunity to give back. And I, I, all the riders have said when they've gotten to see the children that are in that hospital firsthand and meet them really puts what we're doing as a charity into perspective. Yeah, yeah. Racing is important and we all love it. That's why we're here. But to see these kids and, and the struggles they're going through, trying to, to get better and live normal lives, you know, I, I think it's not duty, but I am very, I feel very proud and uh, fortunate to be able to go and spend time with them and learn about the process and all the great work that's being done behind the scenes, not only by Feld Entertainment, but all the riders donating things to this. So, for me, it's the least I can do is go and share my time and hopefully put a smile on a kid's face who, they're, let's face it, they're having a really tough time. And if, if kids don't touch you to your very soul, uh, you may want to check and see if you have a pulse. So uh, I think it's going to be a difficult day, but I think it's going to, to be one of those days where you're going to appreciate the, ha the things that are good in your life and also understand how you can help others that are in need. And as we talk about Nashville, there's just so much of a focus on it. Again, it is our St. Jude uh, race, and also the points are tied and the East-West showdown. But let's not forget, this is all part of the entire season. We announced the SMX playoff dates, locations, track maps pretty recently. I just want to highlight the atmosphere at these races. First of all, we get to have a race just outside of Charlotte and finally a race back in Las Vegas. That alone, the fact that we're servicing two markets that you know have people that have been dying to go to a race, finally got one in Charlotte last year and it was successful enough to bring it back. That alone is exciting enough. But this is, as we learned last year, JT, a different atmosphere. It's not quite Supercross. It's not quite Motocross. Kind of melding the best of both worlds together, especially with the camping part. Yeah, it truly is its own unique thing, right? A weekend event is not something we've had in our sport for a very long time. Outside of the Motocross of Nations, it's really the only weekend type event that we've had where there's there's going to be a live show that we're going to perform on, on Friday that the, the fans can all be involved in. There's qualifying, there's, there's you know, practice on, on Friday. There's all these things that fans don't normally get to see. Uh, we even had a live movie one of the nights that people could come over and, and watch a screening of. So there's just so many more activities than I think fans are used to. And you think about the camping that went on in Charlotte, that caught me completely by surprise. And think of how that's going to grow now that more people actually know what to expect. And anything like this Montreal Supercross Championship, we are in for a barn burner SMX playoff championship as well. Yeah, the point structure, folks, is pretty much guaranteed that we're going to go to that race in Las Vegas not knowing who's going to win. So you're crazy if you don't go to that one. That's bucket list racing back in Las Vegas for the first time in a while. Okay, back to this championship. We will talk about it more in depth with Clinton Fowler and some stats coming up. But the tie, I can't emphasize this enough. We don't get this very often. Chase Sexton, by the way, is still lurking. Just 15 points back. More on that in a moment. 
But I, I don't know. To use the Vegas analogy, who do you bet on here? Jet, who's fast, or Cooper, who's an experienced veteran and just figures out a way to get it done? This is so hard to know what's going to come next, and that's what makes it so exciting. Yeah, choose your fighter. Uh, I, I did not think we would have this situation with four rounds to go. It really felt like Jet was on the precipice of running away with this thing. But in hindsight, we should know better. This is what Cooper Webb does. He hangs around, he finds a way. He's the ultimate competitor. When he's up against the wall, that's when he brings his best stuff. And I, I think that's what we saw from him last weekend in Foxborough. We saw the best of Cooper Webb. And Jet Lawrence could say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm still able to go faster. I beat him in the heat race. But Cooper Webb's, he knows when it's time to perform, get the start, put in perfect laps, and you get all the points. So it's uh, it's kind of a convergence of two different techniques and styles of going about this. We're going to see which one wins out over the next four weekends. It is a phenomenal time to be a fan of Monster Energy Supercross. Now, another interesting subplot that is happening in these races. When this year began, the anticipation was Tomac versus jet not as much web we we thought we knew what we have a cooper web because an smx on a yamaha he was not good he wasn't even close to jet so we weren't even thinking about this we wanted to see eli battle jet and honestly over the last couple of weekends we're finally getting that they had a good run the middle race at the triple crown in st louis and they battled each other coming through traffic at foxborough now jet got the edge on him both times he eventually passed him eventually pulled away but i would love to know what Eli Tomac has seen around the kid for the last couple laps, what he analyzes with his dad, John, and the Monster Energy Star Yamaha team will probably never hear what they're thinking, but they're analytical people. I would love to know the notes that Eli's taking with this new riding style. Yeah, I think everybody's in the same boat as Eli, that, you know, Jet has come in and, and he's doing things not completely differently, but it, it seems like he's just leveled up. He's just doing them a little bit cleaner, a little bit quicker. He's putting combinations together that most riders aren't doing uh so yeah it's, it's just the evolution of the sport every so often we see this rider that can really force everyone to to raise their game and i go back to last summer you know we asked eli tomac at Bell media days did you really pay attention to this jet lawrence undefeated season in pro motocross and he said well not really but when he got to 12 and 0 i had to sit up and take note right i had to pay attention because this was clearly something that I, it was forcing my hand to pay attention to. So I think ever since then, it has been a note taking situation. He just happens to be a little bit closer to it than he was last summer. And there's another rider that has been in that same situation quite a bit, Chase Sexton. Now look, it has been kind of trendy to dump on Chase Sexton. He couldn't beat Jet outdoors. He couldn't get the SMX title from him. It hasn't been a complete slam dunk switching to KTM. Hey. He's only 15 points down. He could win this title again. How about that? Yeah, he's he's riding better than he has been. And, and I still point to the fact that I don't think he has that raw speed that he had in 2023. That was really his calling card, and, and he leaned on that when he needed it. We haven't seen that yet. He still hasn't been the fastest qualifier yet, which is shocking in and of itself. But if you're looking for a silver lining, the riding is improving, right? You could argue that had he passed Ken Roxon sooner, had he had a few more laps in Foxborough, he could have been your winner. We know how close he was to winning in Seattle. So I think you're always trying to understand the situation. You don't want to be overconfident, but at the same time, you need to stay motivated and stay positive as we go down the stretch here. And I think his riding gives him plenty of reasons to be you know, happier than let's say he was earlier in the season. One last thing, let's get to the track map at Nashville, take us for a ride and see what we're in store for on Saturday night. Yeah, so I, I always find it interesting because you'll see little subtle things that the SMX track crew has incorporated from previous rounds. The first thing that jumped out to me was the configuration before the whoop section. It's almost identical to Indianapolis where we saw Jet Warrens jumping into those whoops. It has that little corkscrew with the wall jump, then the whoops. We'll see if that comes into play. Do they jump into the whoops? That was, that was really the story leaving Indianapolis. Another thing, the setup before the finish line is identical to Birmingham. It has that little hook in it, bends backward down the, down the start straight and into a tight 180. Let's hope that the Monster Energy uh, <laughs> lady with the uh, 30 second board will stay off the track and we don't have to hear the oh no from Weech again. But um, yeah, you always see little subtle nuances that the, the track crew brings back 
And does it play a role? Maybe, maybe not. But these riders are going to look at that and that line, that loop line especially, is going to be something they're going to think about right away. Oh, this is the same. Can I take advantage of that same line that I used back in Indianapolis? Personally, I love the 180 berm turn after the finish into the start stretch. It's one of the few areas in Supercross where the inside sometimes still works. Most of the time, everyone goes to the same line. It's either a defined inside or a defined outside. There could be some cat and mouse, especially with a 250 East West showdown. I would not be surprised to see guys running into each other, trying to decide where to go in that turn. It's going to be a really fun weekend. Be careful, Cody Shock. Be careful, Cody Shock. That's all we, we can <laughs> yes, say. It happened. It happened. It's true. <laughs> SMX Facts Time. Boy, do we have things to break down. So to help us do it, we're bringing in our statistician, Clinton Fowler. We will talk about the time points, but first let's talk 250 East-West Showdown. What are you seeing when you look into this race in the past, Clinton? Yeah, Weege, I look back at the all-time wins and uh, an interesting list of three riders with three wins. You got Jeff Emig from the early 1990s, Kevin Windham from the late 1990s. And then a current rider, Adam Cincerulo, with three wins uh, from 2017 to 2019. So kind of interesting to look at the list because I don't see is really the notable piece, which is some of the all-time greats there. Um, the McGraths, the Stewarts, the Carmichaels. Some of that is obviously because they didn't race as many years in the small bike class. But I think this just race is just pretty unique. And so JT, unique race, where do you rank this? amongst all the other types of races that we have for these guys. Yeah, it's a very different dynamic, right? You have, to me, it feels more like a pro motocross championship race than it does supercross because you're doubling the talent, right? And you throw in really tight point uh, championship points races as well. And then it just ups the ante for, for everything. I think you just have to be a little bit more perfect than you are at the other races. You can't come back from a poor start you can't make any mistakes because you're going to be punished much more for them. So it will be interesting, I think, to look at, not necessarily in the points championship, but for a guy like Joe Shimoda, who has had a really tough time early laps, can he figure out a way to get up front? Because if he doesn't, he's not going to get back near the podium. He's going to end up seventh or eighth, and that's going to feel like a very, very poor result. So I just think you have to bring your A game to these showdown races much more than maybe you would on a normal weekend. And to that end, we have a couple of maybe surprising, I'd say, guys in this current field that have won showdowns, and they're probably not the names that everyone would expect, Clinton. Yeah, I was I was surprised by this looking it up. There's two riders that have previous East-West showdown victories. Nate Thrasher at the final in uh, Salt Lake City in 2022, and Max Anstey in the mud race of East Rutherford in 2023. So kind of guys, again, that you wouldn't expect or necessarily see there. It was Anstey's first ever win, pretty impressive. Both of these guys, maybe these guys are ones that get their second win. They could be the surprises, the ones that don't have pressure. Thrasher's ninth in the West region, Anstey's seventh in the East region. Thrasher's had a win in San Diego this year, so he shows that he has the capability. Anstey's got the speed. He's been fastest qualifier the last three rounds. He just hasn't put it together when we get to the main event. So these guys could show up and win it. What do you think, JT? Do these guys win it, or do we see one of these title contenders right now win it? I think we're going to see one of the usual suspects get it done. Uh, the guys that have been at the front of the series, and, and you could argue that Max Anstey was there, because remember, he was your points leader going into Birmingham, where he, his, he had a mechanical failure there. But I, I do think it's going to be one of the Levi Kitchen, Hayden Deegan, one of the guys with the momentum. They've been getting the start. They've been riding incredibly well. Uh, I think one of them will step up and grab this race and maybe the championship by the horns. Okay, tune in to next week's show. If a Shimoda or a Thrasher or Anstey win, we'll be hammering on JT on next week's show. Now let's go to the 450 class and the tie. I know you're thinking about this, Clinton. Yeah, I mean, this to me brings back a couple of seasons that give me both scenarios of does Jet Lawrence pull this out or does he not? So you go back to 1990, you got a rookie in Jeff Matasevich. He's got a 21 point lead over Jeff Stanton after eight rounds, but he ultimately ends up losing the lead at round 15. He loses the title at round 17. And so there's that path that we could go with, with Cooper Webb having fought his way back in. Or you've got 2017 where Eli Tomac is down 29 points to Ryan Dungey after round six. He claws his way back, similar to the way that 
that Cooper Webb has clawed his way back now. Eli has a three-point lead after round 15 in Seattle. But ultimately, Ryan Dungey prevails. He wins the title. So, JT, what do you think we're looking at this year with Jet Lawrence, Cooper Webb, and Chase Sexton? Well, I'd love to tell you this answer after Salt Lake, just so I can sound smarter and have the uh, hindsight context there. But to me, I love the comparison of 2017 with Eli Tomac and Ryan Dungey because I felt like, you know, Ryan was the elder statesman. You know, it wasn't quite done yet, but you could see it on the horizon. I think similar to Cooper Webb, we don't know how much longer Coop's going to be around for. Then you have this upstart who's really just burgeoning into the prime of his career. And it, he's on the precipice of greatness, which was Eli Tomac, right? So it's it feels very much like that. Now, we don't know if history is going to repeat itself where Tomac has this epic meltdown in New Jersey and Ryan Dungey, with the help of his teammate Marvin Muscan, rises to the occasion and gets it done. But those comparisons where situationally, the speed difference between Tomac and Dungey and then the age and experience difference too, it feels eerily similar to that. Yeah, I'm with you on that one, JT. As we talked about in our podcast on Sunday night, Eli not getting that title when he was clearly the fastest guy, that haunted him for a long time. And he had to wear this tag of couldn't get it done under pressure and all these other things that I really think affected his demeanor for a while. So that's what's on the line here. Uh, meanwhile, I would think, JT, if you're Cooper Webb, this is just house money. I mean, there's pressure because the title's on the line. But if he wins this, I think it's considered a bonus, not a loss if he doesn't get it. Well, let, let's go back to last September. You can't even go back to last summer in Promoter Cross Championship, but really when he made the, the jump to Monster Yamaha Star Racing, we all said, okay, this is gonna be Cooper Webb again. He's, he's back where he wants to be. He's gonna be happy again. And then the results were not there. He did not look good. He really wasn't even relevant. He goes to Paris in the off season, no real change there. So I think if you offered him at any point during that time to be tied with four races to go in the 2024 Monster Energy Supercross Championship, he would do anything you asked to be in this situation. So yes, to your point, this is house money. He has to be over the moon about where he finds himself in this championship and the improvements he's made. So points be what they may, it really feels like Cooper Webb has all the momentum and all the sentiment gain in this situation doesn't mean he's going to win out. But if you had to choose a side or who's happier about being tied with four races left, it has to be Webb. Uh, Clinton, I know that it's hard to put data together to extrapolate pressure, but I'm going to put pressure on you here. You did. This is not part of what you originally wanted to talk about in this episode, but just mention lap times and what you saw in Foxborough. I don't know what it means going forward. There's both. There's some good numbers on both sides of this. You had Cooper Webb, who gets fastest qualifier. We don't see that often from Cooper, so that was a surprise. He clearly was working on speed during the time off. He was also fastest in the main event, so great there. But Jet Lawrence was absolutely incredible in the second half of that main event. He was fastest in the last seven laps. He was fastest in the last nine and 12 laps. So clearly it was just a matter of being, you know, sensitive and not making a mistake early in that main event when he had a bad start, but he had the speed. So who knows? Both of the guys had speed um, and it, it just seems like we're in for a great battle for the remainder of the year, guys. All right. We got, we're out of time. We got to go. JT, I know you want to talk more about this. We got three hours this weekend on TV, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for the data, Clinton. Thanks guys. Okay. So much to unpack. I hope you can intake everything we brought you on this episode. This is so exciting, JT. If you want to watch the show, 1.30 in the afternoon, Eastern Time on Saturday. That's Race Day Live on Peacock. We'll be racing at 7 o'clock Eastern Time, Peacock. And of course, if you're outside the United States, we have the SMX video pass for you. This is a feast, man. We have a time points. We have Chase Sexton still in it. We have Eli Tomac still trying to prove that he can be the guy. We have an East-West showdown. You name it. What more can you ask for? Yeah, we're, we have the, uh, the best setup possible. Three championships that still feel really, really wide open. So uh, it's going to be a heck of a Saturday. Yep. I'll be back in the booth at Ricky Carmichael. You'll be on the floor at Will Christian. We will see everyone in Nashville for what could be the most pivotal round of this early season of SMX. Thanks for joining us.